What's up, eco nerdlings? In this podcast, we're going to be discussing energy resources. Specifically, we're going to be talking about oil and natural gas. So before we get started, I want to make sure you take some time, hit the pause button, and write down the following questions. And I want you to go ahead and answer those in your journals as we get through that material in our podcast. All right, so let's get started. Energy resources. We have two types. We have primary sources and we have secondary sources. By definition, primary sources are the original sources that are used to make electricity or heat. Secondary sources are the heat and the electricity that we actually use for energy. So cogeneration. This is the production of two useful forms of energy, such as high temperature heat or steam and electricity from the same fuel source. So for example, an industry using natural gas for manufacturing and using the waste heat to produce electricity. So here's some examples of primary sources. First and foremost, we have fossil fuels. That's what you hear about in the news all the time about the depleting uh, reserves of our fossil fuels. So different energy conversions take place when we're using fossil fuels. We can go from chemical to electrical, or we can go from heat to mechanical, but it only runs at about 30% efficiency. The benefits of using fossil fuels are that they're very easy to use and they are currently abundant, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be abundant 50 years from now or 200 years from now. Some of the costs are that they are a non-renewable resource and it produces pollutants that can contribute to anything from acid rain to the greenhouse gas effect. We also have oil, and that supplies most of the commercial energy in the entire world today. People in the United States actually use 23 barrels of petroleum per person. That totals at about 6 billion barrels each year, and that number is growing as the population grows. So one of the case studies in this unit is just how long will the oil party last? Well, Saudi Arabia could supply the world with oil for about 10 years, going at the rate that we're currently at. And then we have the Alaska's North Slope that could meet the world oil demand for about six months and the United States for about three years. We also have another oil source in Alaska and that's in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And that would meet the world demand anywhere from one to five months, and in the United States, anywhere from seven months to about two years. So we have crude oil or petroleum, and this is a very thick liquid containing hydrocarbons that we can extract from underground deposits and separate into products such as gasoline, heating oil, and asphalt. Only 35 to 50 percent of this can actually be economically recovered from a deposit. And as the prices rise, about 10 to 25% more can be recovered from expensive secondary extraction techniques. This actually lowers the net energy yield. So looking at the diagram right here, this is showing us the process of refining crude oil. The refining process takes place based on the boiling points of the components that are removed from the reserve. And they're removed in various layers in a huge giant distillation column which is what you see right here. The most volatile or basically the most flammable, it's not going to be very stable, those are the ones with the lowest boiling points and they're removed up here at the top. So starting at the very top, obviously we have gases which are going to be the absolute most volatile. Then we have gasoline, aviation fuel that we use to power our planes. We have heating oil, diesel fuel, we have naphtha, and then we have grease and wax followed by asphalt way down at the bottom, which means that's the most stable. So there are 11 countries that we call the OPEC, or the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. And those 11 countries have 78% of the world's proven oil reserves and most of the world's unproven reserves as well. After the global production peaks and begins a slow decline, Oil prices are going to rise, and those could threaten the economies of the countries that have not really shifted from new energy alternatives. And that's something of much debate right now. So another case study is the oil supplies in the United States. 
How long are they going to last? What's going to go on with our oil prices? Well, the United States is the world's largest oil user, and it has only 2.9% of the world's proven oil reserves, which means we're going to have to import all that oil from other countries. So when a relationship goes a little bit south with another country, if that's one of our main oil uh, countries that we import oil from, then we're going to have to drastically increase oil prices to meet the demand. So, the United States oil production peaked at about 1974, which is halfway through the production point. And about 60% of the United States oil imports go through refineries in hurricane-prone regions of the Gulf Coast, which is where we live. We live close to Galveston, and that's where a lot of oil um, on that Gulf Coast is going to be extracted and refined. So when a hurricane comes through, if it destroys a lot of the refineries, that's going to limit the processing of the oil and it's going to increase the oil prices around the United States. So we have heavy oils from sand and oil shale. So will this sticky black gold save us all? Well, what is it? It's heavy and tar-like oils from oil sand and oil shale that could supplement conventional oil. But there are always environmental problems associated with any type of fuel source that we're looking at involving you know, oil and things like that. So first of all, it has a very high sulfur content. And the extracting and processing procedures can produce toxic sludge, and it uses and contaminates large volumes of water. It also requires a large input of natural gas, which reduces the net energy yield. So this is what an oil shale looks like that we just got through talking about. Um, oil shales contain a solid combustible mixture of hydrocarbons called kerogen, and that's what gets extracted from them. So again, how long is that oil party going to last? Well, we have three options that we have to look through in our future. Number one, we can either look for more oil. Number two, we could use or waste less oil. And number three, we could find some type of alternative fuel. And lots of research is going into that third option. We're probably going to have to use a combination of all three. So natural gas. Well, natural gas is consisting mostly of methane, and it's often found above reservoirs of crude oil. When a natural gas field is tapped, gases are liquefied and removed as liquid petroleum gas, which we call LPG. Coal beds and bubbles of methane trapped in ice crystals deep under the Arctic permafrost and beneath the deep ocean sediments are unconventional sources of natural gas. Russia and Iran have almost half of the world's reserves of conventional gas, and the global reserve should last anywhere from 62 to 125 years. But again, after that, where are we going to go? What are we going to use? Well, natural gas is versatile and it's very clean burning fuel. However, it does release greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide when it's burned. It also releases methane from the leaks and it leaks into the troposphere. So we also have coal. And coal is a solid fossil fuel that is formed in several stages as the buried remains of land plants that lived 300 to 400 million years ago. So it's obviously one of our non-renewable resources. So looking at how it forms and the different types of coal that there are, we have an increasing moisture content, and then going this way, increasing heat and carbon content. So first of all, we start off with peat, which isn't really coal at all. It's partially decayed plant matter in swamps and bogs, and it has a very, very low heat content. As more heat and pressure applied, we see lignite, and that's a brown coal. Still has a low heat content, low sulfur content, and it's in limited supplies in most areas. When more heat and pressure occur, we have bituminous or soft coal. This is extensively used as fuel because it has a high heat content and it's in large supplies. It also normally has a very high sulfur content. And then last, we have anthracite, which is a very hard coal. This is a highly desirable fuel because of its high heat content and low sulfur content and supplies are limited in most areas. Coal reserves in the United States, Russia, and China could last hundreds of years to over a thousand years, depending on how much of it we use and for what we use it. 
The United States has about 27% of the world's proven coal reserves, followed by Russia at 17% and China at 13%. In 2005, China and the United States accounted for about 53% of the global coal consumption. Well, I hope you learned a little bit about non-renewable energy resources. If you need to review this video or any other ones from AP Environmental Science, please go to my website at www.nerdlingscience.com. Well, this is the Queen Nerdling signing out for today. Stay nerdy till next time.